thinking about uncertainty as a matter of primal importance can actually help you understand things about the system that you perhaps didn't understand. It may give you new insights. I often think, well, when, when do you ever go to an astrologer and he gives you an error bar on the prediction that you'll meet a tall, dark stranger in two weeks? I mean, they don't do that. And in a way, you should always take that as a lesson. If you see a, a graph of a prediction without any estimate of uncertainty, it's a good reason to throw the prediction in the waste paper basket. But in a sense, um, there's something kind of deeper here. And I think the idea was captured very well by Richard Feynman, the great theoretical physicist of the 20th century, who said, our freedom to doubt was born of a struggle against authority in the early days of science. It was a very deep and strong struggle. Permit us to question, to doubt. That's all, not to be sure. And then James Glick, who wrote a very well-known biography of Feynman, um, really encapsulated this sentiment in one sentence. He, Feynman, believed in the primacy of doubt, not as a blemish on our ability to know, but as the essence of knowing. So that's very much where that phrase primacy of doubt comes from, from that kind of quote. It's something I came across quite a few years ago now, and it's kind of been a guiding principle in many of my uh, work. In order to understand the topics that I want to talk about, you have to understand a little bit of my own personal biography and sort of apologies for being a bit self-indulgent in that area, but otherwise none of this will make sense. So I did my PhD uh, back in the 1970s in Oxford in general relativity, so Einstein's theory of gravity. And literally, um, the first conference I went to... Um, I heard Stephen Hawking, because he hadn't actually lost his voice then, um, give his most famous results in science, which is that black holes can evaporate quantum mechanically. They give off these quantum particles. Mm. And my own supervisor, a um, guy called Dennis Sharma, who incidentally was also Hawking's supervisor, and interestingly, if you know anything about you, British science, Sharma was a student of Paul Dirac, who was probably after Einstein, uh, after a Newton, rather, um, not after, after Newton, he was the, probably the most famous and well-known British physicist. Um, so Sharma was really, and quite a lot of the community, were very excited by this result, that black holes evaporate particles, and it seemed to combine three different areas of, of physics, general relativity, quantum mechanics, and thermodynamics. And there was a lot of optimism that... The, the holy grail of physics, which is the unification of gravity with the other forces of nature, was about to happen. This is back in the, uh, well, actually 1974. There was a lot of enthusiasm that we were about to, you know, this thing that we've been searching for for years was about to happen. But actually it hasn't happened. And uh, if people went to the uh, debate with Roger Penrose and Sabina Hossenfelder, you'd see it still hasn't happened. We're still arguing about how to unify forces. And some people string, think string theory is the way forward. And people like Roger and Sabina will tell you, no, that's not the case. So why is it, and this is sort of one of the things I, I wrestled with at the time of my PhD, why is it that um, unifying quantum mechanics and relativity is so difficult? And I think my own personal view is it comes down to the issue about uncertainty. Because in quantum mechanics, you know, if you, if you know anything, if you read any of these books, you'll see particles can somehow be here and there at the same time. So the position of a particle is somehow inherently uncertain, according to the theory. Philosopher, philosophers use the word ontological uncertainty to mean this kind of very basic intrinsic notion of uncertainty. There's something in the laws of physics and the basic structure of matter that makes things ontologically uncertain. On the other hand, if you look at gravitational fields and look at the equations of general relativity, everything is perfectly certain and deterministic. It's only if there is uncertainty, it's only because we are uncertain about the value of the gravitational field. It's our uncertainty, not general relativity's uncertainty. 
So again, philosophers would call that epistemological uncertainty. And there's this tension then between this epistemological uncertainty on the one hand in gravity and ontological uncertainty in quant quantum mechanics. And my own view is, and it, it kind of a, the view I started to evolve towards in those days, and certainly my view now, that this is probably the most fundamental question in physics. Is the nature of uncertainty at the very, very deepest level ontological or epistemological? Is it the uncertainty of nature, or is it the fact that we can never know everything about the world outside us? Anyway, these kind of problems um, ultimately made me decide there was no way I was going to uh, make, make any progress. It was somehow too deep. And um, by chance, I, I met a, a climatologist who convinced me this was a good time to change fields. And so I was in the possibly fortunate, possibly unfortunate position of having two job offers at the same time. One was actually to work with Hawking in Cambridge to carry on the kind of relativity, quantum gravity work. And the other was a job, a much more kind of prosaic sounding job at the Met Office to work on weather and climate prediction. And I absolutely angst about this for weeks and weeks. And I was like, you know, Buridan's donkey, couldn't move towards the either the pail of water or the, or the bale of hay. Just didn't know. I was absolutely paralyzed by analysis. Yeah, paralysis by analysis. That was me for several weeks. And then I got just so frustrated by this, I decided to hell with it. I'm going to just carry on with my research for two weeks and then return to it again. For some reason, out of nowhere, my subconscious said, made the decision for me, and it said, go to the Met Office. So that's what I did, and I've had a pretty good career, I think. But it's kind of fascinated me, and if I have time at the end, I'll come back to it. How do we make decisions under profound uncertainty? It's something that's really fascinated me. And why is it, when we leave it to our subconscious, we actually can seem to make decisions where when we just analyze things, we get paralyzed? So that's an interesting question. Now, uh, some of the older generation will rec recognize this guy, Michael Fish. Yeah, uh, a folk hero. Um, he kind of represents a time at the Met Office where you never really admitted to uncertainty. If you wanted to make a weather forecast, you got on the TV and you say, it will be rainy tomorrow or it will be sunny or the next day will be stormy. There was never any doubt, or at least if there was doubt, you never admitted to it. You know, it would undermine your professionalism so the theory went, to admit to uncertainty. Now, I have to say, this was in the... I mean, the, so for those who don't know, Michael Fish famously said on an evening TV weather forecast, um, well, he said, this is what he said, earlier on today, apparently a woman rang the BBC and said she heard there was a hurricane on the way. Uh, don't, if you're watching, don't worry, there isn't. And there was, and all hell broke loose in southern England. Seven oaks lost all of its oaks, and... Um, Damage, I think, that today would be in the billions uh, was... was uh, and, and people just couldn't understand. How could, you know, how could you get a weather forecast so wrong? Now, one thing uh, that people did know about in the 1980s was the work of Ed Lorentz and what's called chaos, now called chaos theory. And the idea that if you start to predictions of a chaotic system from almost but not quite identical... Uh, starting conditions, they can diverge. Eventually, they'll completely diverge and decorrelate. Now, people knew that in the 1970s, but the thinking was that the time scale for these, for two weather forecasts to diverge, would be a, like a couple of weeks or three weeks. The so called butterfly effect, the flap of a butterfly, whether a butterfly does or doesn't flap its wings, changing the weather, it would take several weeks for that to happen. And in particular, making weather forecasts just a few days ahead should be a pretty deterministic and um, un sort of, you know, something you could make with confidence. Now, one of the very first things I did at the Met Office was starting to look at, starting, I started to look at these chaotic models much more carefully. And something very interesting emerges, which is shown in these three pictures. Um, this, is a, this is a model a very simple mathematical model devised by this guy called Ed Lorentz, who was a 
MIT, was at MIT in Boston. He was kind of a half mathematician, half meteorologist. And the yellow dots are a fantastically interesting geometry called the fractal geometry. But what's shown on top of that are a little initial ring of points. So you imagine inside that initial ring, there's a little bit of uncertainty about exactly where the starting condition is. Let's say it could be anywhere within that ring. Then depending on the, where the ring is in, this, in terms of this geometry, it can either, the top left one shows, it can hardly, hardly expand at all. The ring stays pretty small. Or it can start to grow or it can start to really explode. And the latter one, you know, can occur just within a very short time scale of a few days. And I argued that, and this was actually before the 1987 storm, that this could happen, you know, in a weather forecast. We could get explosive uncertainty because the degree of chaos in a system like weather, according to this picture, it's not something that's the same every day. It varies. Some days you can get a lot of predictability and some days not. So how would you actually find that out ahead of time? Well, the answer is you'd run not just one weather forecast every day. You'd run a whole load of weather forecasts. You'd run 50 weather forecasts and just look to see how they diverged. I have to say my colleagues were very skeptical about this because they said running... 50 almost identical weather forecasts seems like an awful waste of computer time. We could do better things with our computers than running them 50 times. But the, um, the Michael Fish storm really nailed the argument. It, it, was, it was kind of Mother Nature speaking. It did, did me a great favor in a sense because it showed that this really was, um, I don't know if there's a pointer or not, but um, that bottom one could actually happen in reality. So you, you probably can't see this, but this was the original, uh, what we now call ensemble forecast, 50 forecasts a couple of days before Michael Fish's storm, with almost identical initial conditions, just little flaps of butterflies differing from one of these postage stamp maps to the other. And then we move them all forward uh, two days, and there's a fantastic spread of possible solutions. So this is telling you, this is hyper... We're in a situation where Mother Nature is hypersensitive to uncertainties in the starting conditions. So what can you do with that? Well, you can combine all those, that information to make probabilities. And that's pretty much what, you know, what we do today. So in the case of the Michael Fish storm, you can count the number of, of those little map, you know, stamp map things that had hurricane force winds. Um, and divide it by the total number of forecasts that we made, which was 50. Uh, so if we had, say, 15 out of 50, that would be a 30% probability of getting a hurricane. And that's what this map shows. It's a probability map. So this has kind of led, it's completely changed the philosophy of weather prediction into a much more probabilistic uh, science. And, you know, one of the consequences of that is that whenever you look at your weather app these days and it shows the probability of rain, that's where it comes from. They count, you know, let's say this is for hay on why. I got this a couple of days ago, I think, for um, Saturday. So there was, you see there's probabilities of 40 percent or so, which means that 40 percent of that ensemble of 50 forecasts had rain <coughs> on hay on why. Now. You may kind of, as I say, you may kind of curse probabilities for being difficult to use and so on. But one area where they've had a major uh, impact is in what's called anticipatory action uh, for major severe weather events. So we can use ensembles to look also at um, hurricanes. So these are three examples of on, an ensemble forecast. The top one is of a tropical cyclone that that hit Bangladesh. These are forecasts made about a week before. Uh, the middle one is Katrina, which is the famous hurricane that hit New Orleans. But a week before, you can see you hardly would know where on the Gulf Coast or indeed whether it's going to track up the, the coast of Florida. And the bottom one is a, is a hurricane called Nadine, where it was completely and utterly unpredictable, a bit like the three examples in Lorenz's model. But what happens now is that dis 
humanitarian agencies actually make use of these probabilities to decide when to send in things like medicine and, and food and water and shelter, you know, temporary shelters ahead of some predicted storm. You know, in the past, it's always been frustrating. You've, you've seen on the TV, typically these agencies only act after the event has hit. And you say, well, why didn't you act ahead of time? And they say, well, we haven't got that much money. And if we went in for every hint there might be a severe storm, we'd, you know, we'd lose all our funding immediately. So what they do now is they, they have a very hard and fast calculation of a threshold probability for a, a major hurricane or tropical cyclone, above which they will then act preemptively. And it's called, the whole program is called anticipatory action. And it's really changing the way in which humanitarian agencies work. So although, yeah, although probabilities may be a bit painful, if you like, on your weather app, they, they really have a, they serve a, an important purpose uh, for, for really severe weather. So let me, let me move on to um, economics. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.